Psalm 2 was the scripture reading today, where a scripture reading that is actually related directly to the text we're going to be looking at in Acts chapter 4. And so if you haven't already, if you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 4, there's two psalms that are quoted. One is Psalm 118, and one is Psalm 2, which was read for the scripture reading. And Psalm 2 is a warning to those in power. Psalm 2 is a warning to people who are in power and authority. It's warning them against their raging, against their conspiring, it says in in Psalm 2, against their plotting, against the anointed one. That's the Messiah. The the anointed one is an Old Testament phrase for the Messiah, the anointed one. The Christ. That's who they're plotting against. That's who they're raging against. The nations. People who are in authority and power. And so when we get to Acts chapter 4, if your Bibles are open, look with me at verse 1. It says, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed. Interesting. People in power were greatly disturbed because the apostles were, look what it says, teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So people in power and authority are greatly disturbed because these followers of Jesus who are filled with the Holy Spirit are speaking about Jesus in public and teaching people about the resurrection from the dead. You see, the good news, the gospel means the good news. And you have to just stop and think. You have to wonder, how could something that's called good news be a threat to anybody, right? How could the good news of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, the good news that he offers us forgiveness when we turn away from our sins, how could that possibly be a threat to anybody if it's good news. How can the good news be seen as a threat to anyone? In fact, I've often wondered this week as I was preparing this message, is there anything about our message today that gets us in trouble? What gets Christians in trouble today about their message? Is it our message about Jesus or is it a political party we've attached ourselves to? See, it's easy to say you're being persecuted for your faith when really what you've done is you've signed up for a political platform. Is our message about Jesus, or have we attached it to a certain side of the aisle, or no aisle at all? And so here, we see something that's very instructive for the world we live in today. And what we see is that people who are in power are threatened by the good news of the gospel. And here's a, here's a litmus test. If people in power are not threatened by the good news of the gospel that I'm living out, then I have to ask myself whether I'm living out the good news of the gospel. Not that I'm trying to look for people to persecute me or oppress me in any way. Not that I'm trying to be a jerk for God. That's not what this is supposed to be about. But in living out my faith in Jesus, is there anything about the way we conduct ourselves as a church, myself, privately? Is there anything about that that is any sort of a threat to those who are in authority? You see, when, when God does something new, then it might mean that people who are in power lose the power in the new world that God's creating. In the new order that God's bringing about when people's lives are being changed by the good news of Jesus Christ, truly life transformation, all of a sudden, you see, in our eyes, put it, let me help you think of it this way. In our eyes, Jesus, when he comes into my life, he comes into your life, he's turning our worlds right side up. That's a good thing. But think about it from the perspective of the person who's in power and authority. When Jesus starts changing people's lives, in the eyes of those in power, Jesus is turning their world upside down. 
Let me give you a practical example of this. There was a famous Welsh revival back at the turn of the century. By the turn of the century, I mean the 1900s, not 2000. There was a famous Welsh revival where many people were, I mean, it, it was a, they were godless people. They wanted nothing to do with Christianity. They knew about Christianity, but they worked down in the mines. And in these mines, they had these donkeys that they used to pull the resources out of the earth. And the way that they would talk to these donkeys and these animals is they would curse at them in order to get them to pull the stuff out of the earth. Well, what happened was this revival came through these villages in, in, in Wales. And, and so many people came to know Jesus who were like, let's just say they were coal miners, okay? Think of coal miners. So many of them came to Jesus that their, the way they started talking changed. They no longer were cursing at these animals because of their new relationship with Jesus. And guess what happened? The donkeys didn't move. It's a true story, by the way. True story. They couldn't get the resources out of the earth. So all of a sudden, those in power who own the mining company are very threatened by the transformation that's taking place in the lives of people who are now following Jesus. So in your outline, if you'd write this down, how does the church respond to opposition from those in authority? How does the church respond to opposition from those in authority? Or in other words, what are some practical ways to face persecution from people in power? Practical ways to face persecution. So look with me again at verse 1. Let's see what we, can, what we can discover here. How to respond. Verse 1. The priests and the captains of the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. While they were speaking to the people. Where? In the temple area. We've been talking about this every day at the end of chapter 2. The church was meeting in the temple area. They were teaching in public. They were teaching people about Jesus in the temple area. Well, it's like the, the park rangers. That's the, the temple police. They showed up. Now, they don't mind. Anybody can meet in the temple area. Anybody, it's a huge area, 30-some acres, square acres. I mean, it's a large area, this temple area back in Jesus' day. And, and they would meet. And they didn't mind if you wanted to have, like, your group meet off into a corner of the temple area, the, the court area. You could have your little Bible study. You could talk about it. As long as it kind of kept under control and you were civil and well-behaved, you, you could have somebody teach about God in public. You could do that in the temple area. But if things started getting out of hand, then it would all of a sudden catch the, the attention of the temple guard. And the, the Sadducees were political religious leaders of the day. The message that the apostles were teaching wasn't about political corruption. It wasn't disobey the Sadducees. It wasn't those terrible people in power. That's not what they were teaching in the temple court. The apostles weren't teaching that. What they were teaching the people is that Jesus has been raised from the dead. In other words, the new age has come. God's kingdom has broken through. God is changing people's lives. Jesus is alive. And people, the message was about Jesus. Let's get this straight. The message was about Jesus. It was not a political rally. It was about Jesus. Look at verse 2. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, if you have your Bible open, look back to chapter 3, verse 21. Notice this. There's a connection here. Look at chapter 3, verse 21 where it says, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. So the message of Jesus being raised from the dead is that Jesus is in heaven right now, reigning as the king. His kingdom has been inaugurated. It has come here on earth. It is among us, as Jesus said. Not in its fullness, because he one day will come again and fully restore everything, as we see in chapter 3, verse 21, where he will restore everything just as he promised. So something new is happening. People in power are seeing that people's lives are being changed, and they feel threatened because God is doing something new, and now their perch is being threatened. I love the song we sang earlier today. As I, as I was singing it with everybody, I, was, I circled this last verse of the song, Sing Praise to the a Father with All Creation Sings. And let me just go through those lyrics uh, from Keith and Kristen Getty. It says, Creation longs for his return when Christ shall reign upon the earth. The bitter wars that rage are birth pangs of a coming age. When he renews the land and sky, all heaven will sing and earth reply with one resplendent theme, 
the glory of our God and King. That's what they were teaching in the temple courts. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, and the new age has started. And it threatens people. The power of Jesus' name threatens people. The meaning of Jesus' name threatens people. Now, what did they do? How did they react? When the, when the temple guard, when the park police, when the park ranger comes, and, and they, they confront the apostles doing this with this crowd, what, what do they do? Look at verse 3. Notice verse 3. Back to chapter 4, verse 3. It says, they seized Peter and John. And immediately the Christians gathered and violently resisted everything that was going on. Is there, does your Bible say that? I don't think it does, does it? No, that's not there. Look at what it actually says. Look at what it says. They seized Peter and John. And because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Would you write this down? When it comes to, when it comes to responding to opposition, write down, we are nonviolent toward those in power. We are nonviolent toward those in power. There's no mass protests. There's no threats from Christians. Look with me at verse 4. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men, notice this, the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Now I'll tell you what, if you're, if you're a Sadducee or if you're part of the temple police, you're watching every crowd. You're monitoring every crowd that's gathering in the temple area. If you're in power, you know who's a threat to you. And it's not women and children. It's men. Whenever you watch the news and you see headlines and you see a large crowd of several thousand people, start noticing, are they men or women and, ch and, women and children? If it's women and children in the crowd, typically not seen as threatening. But if it's all men, watch out. And guess what the authorities are noticing about this new movement, this new spirit-filled group of people following Jesus? They're noticing there's 5,000 men, just men. Now, the women and children are there too, but they don't see the women and children as threatening. And, and I just, I want you to make note of that. They don't see the women and children as threatening. And the authorities did the math. Historically, it's estimated that in this short period of time between the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus and this moment here, that short period of time, about 10%, they estimate about 10% of the population of Jerusalem, 10% of the population of Jerusalem believed in Jesus as the Messiah. 10% of the population of Jerusalem was in that part of the temple courts listening to the early church. 10%. 5,000 of them being men. And they counted. Look at verse 5. The next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Why? It wasn't because there was a bunch of women and children there. Because here's some background information. Women and children posed no threat to those in authority. Women and children had no status. Let me help your mind think of this in this way. Do you remember when Jesus was crucified, what all the apostles did all the disciples did they ran and they hid the men the men ran for cover who was at the cross the women and who else john who by the way did you know he was a teenager did you know john wasn't considered a man he was a youth and he wasn't seen as a threat. And John knew he wasn't the threat. So women were at the cross. John was at the cross. John didn't run and hide like everybody else. He was there with Mary. And who went to the tomb in the morning? Not the men. Who went? The women. Why? Because the people in power knew women weren't a threat. And the women knew, I'm not a threat. Now here's something interesting that happens. In Acts chapter 8, all of a sudden, all of a sudden in Acts 8, something strange happens. Because in Acts chapter 8, there's a man named Saul who's in power, who's authorized to do something that has never been done before, to go arrest the men and women and children. Why? 
Why all of a sudden are women and children in the bullseye of those in power? What happened? Here's what happened. Because when the Holy Spirit was poured out at, at Pentecost, men, old and young, men and women, slave and free, all of them received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All of them were using those gifts publicly in teaching. And all of a sudden, the authorities realized, you know what? This is something new. Now we have to control the women and children because they're talking about Jesus and upsetting things also. They learned how to be quiet before, but now they're a threat to us. Interesting change. Look at verse 6. Annas the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. Talk about nepotism. There it is right there in power. Now these are all religious leaders that are listed here, all these names, religious leaders. But they're also political appointees. Each of, these, each of these individuals mentioned were political appointees. So take note. Whenever you see big religion and big government come together, nothing good will happen. When the church signs on to a political platform, nothing good will happen. And so we need to remember this in our day. Look at verse 7. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. Look at the question. They say, by what power and what name did you do this? The this they're referring to is the crowds and the healing of that man, the man who was healed last, last week. They ask the question, where did you get your power from? Or let me rephrase it. What wealthy, powerful person authorized you to do this big crowd? And to heal this man. You see, they don't mind if you keep it a small, harmless little Bible study group off in the corner of the temple area. They don't mind that at all. Good civil, you know, good civil get together, little calm thing. But all of a sudden, this is getting out of hand. There's 5,000 men, there's 10% of the population of the city in this group. And they ask, what, where do you get your power? Where, where, what name do you do this in? Isn't that interesting? That's the same thing they said to Jesus the last week he was alive on earth when he was teaching in the same place in the temple courts. That's the same question they asked Jesus. Who gave you this a power? In fact, one time when Jesus, uh, a previous time before the end of his life, in the middle of his ministry, remember when Jesus was casting out demons and they came to him and they said, whose power do you do this by? And they said it was by the power of the devil, Beelzebub. And Jesus looked at them and said, no, no, it's by the power of the Holy Holy Spirit, and you better be very careful because if you start accusing me of doing things in the power of the devil, if you are getting close to crossing a line you can never go back from. It's called the unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You see, they asked Jesus the same question. Who gave you the power to do this? Whose name are you doing this in? Same question being asked here in verse 7. Look at Peter's response in verse 8. Verse 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people. Now, this is interesting. Bill, I so much appreciated how we prayed together before the service started that the filling of the Holy Spirit. Notice what it says in your Bible. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, would you write this down? We seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit. How do you respond to opposition from those in authority? Seek the fullness. Be filled with the Spirit. This is exactly what Jesus promised them. Jesus promised them that the Holy Spirit would come after Jesus was ascended into heaven, that the Holy Spirit would come and would tell them what to say when they're in situations like this on trial or giving a testimony in public. In fact, do you remember those words? They're on the screen if you want to look at it. Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, when you're brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for, notice this, the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. So we need to depend on the Holy Spirit to fill us and give us words to say. And I think you'll start noticing this as we study the book of Acts, that there always seems to be a connection between the moment someone is filled with the Holy Spirit and the words that come out of their mouth. When they're filled with the Spirit, words come out. 
whether it's boldness and sharing in the name of Jesus or whether it's speaking in unknown languages, when the Spirit comes, it affects the words that come out of our mouth. Look with me at verse 8, if you would. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Peter made it very clear. This man is here. Jesus is the center. He is the place you go for healing. Jesus is the one who turned this man's world upside down and is turning everybody's world upside down. And those in power don't like it. And then he quotes from Psalm 118. Look at verse 11, and you'll see that. Psalm 118, Peter says, Jesus is, and then he quotes, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. It's a direct quote from Psalm 118. And it's obvious that, that Peter had spent a lot of time with Jesus because this is what Jesus did all the time. Whenever Jesus would teach from the Old Testament Scripture, he would say to people, this was pointing to me. I'm the reason. I'm the reason this Old Testament was given. All the promises of the Old Testament are find their fulfillment in who Jesus is. Jesus is the cornerstone of the temple. Jesus is the place. Jesus is the one who gives new life. Jesus is the place. If you want to meet God on earth, then meet him in Jesus. That's where you meet God. Look at verse 12. Peter says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. No one else, no other name. Would you write this down when you face opposition and persecution for your faith? Would you write this down? We have to clearly state the gospel. Clearly state the gospel. And the message doesn't change whether you're in a, in a private conversation or publicly. The message stays the same. We don't shrink back. We don't stutter when we say, we, we don't choke on the words, there's only... There's only one name by which we can be saved. There's no other name. No other name. We, if we start stuttering on that, we have forfeited the good news. There's no other name. It's exclusive. Anyone can come to Jesus only. That's the message. Anyone can come to Jesus only. It doesn't, even those of you who crucified Jesus, come to Jesus only. Only in his name. Look at verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Unschooled and ordinary. For a long time, I thought that meant a lot of the apostles were illiterate, or a number of them were, but I found out as I did research this week that that wasn't the case. Very unlikely that they were illiterate. The unschooling that he's taught, they're talking about here isn't about their ability to read or having gone to school. Most of them went to synagogue school. Most of them learned the Torah. The type of schooling they're talking about here is a very specific type of schooling in that day. You were considered unschooled if you didn't go to Learn how to be a public speaker. Public rhetoric. That's the type of unschooling they're talking about. It was a special skill. And these authorities are surprised that, that Peter, who's been unschooled as a public speaker, could gather a crowd like this better than the religious leaders who got the schooling could. They gathered a crowd. They were unschooled, and yet they gathered this crowd. And it reminded the authorities of Jesus, who also was unschooled in that sense. And yet he was the most persuasive person ever. So they could tell they'd been with Jesus. In fact, when Jesus spoke, he wasn't just persuasive. There was something else that they noticed about Jesus when he spoke. He spoke with authority. Persuasiveness and authority. Authority. 
And Peter witnessed Jesus do that. And now that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter is speaking just like Jesus, having never gone to school to be a rhetorician. He is now speaking persuasively and with authority, with boldness, because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 13 again. Look what it says. They were astonished and they took note that these men had, notice this, had been with Jesus. They noticed Peter had been with Jesus. I realized that as I looked at it this week that the last time Peter heard someone publicly say to him that they knew he had spent time with Jesus was when Peter was at a bonfire while Jesus was on trial. And a little girl said, hey, you've been with Jesus. I don't know who he is. He denied. Now this time, they noticed he'd been with Jesus. And he's telling them he's the only way to go to heaven, boldly. And I wonder sometimes, is there anything about my life that anybody would look at me and say, he's been with Jesus? Is there anything about your life that when people look at you, they say, you've been with Jesus? Just a question. Verse 14. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there's nothing else they could say, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone, notice this, in this name. Verse 18, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. So again, they're nonviolent. They're not violent. They're not whipping up crowds. They're not whipping up crowds to be violent or, can, or hurt anybody or threaten anybody. In fact, they're, willingly, they're willing to go to jail. They didn't fight going to jail. They didn't resist going to jail. But when it comes to what comes out of their mouth, they're not going to be compliant. They're not going to go along. And Peter's answer is the basis of all Christian resistance to power, which is, should we obey God or you? Am I going to obey God or you as the authority? Would you write this down? We obey God no matter what. No matter the cost, we obey God. Peter answers his own question. Should we obey God or you? He says, we're not going to stop speaking in Jesus' name. Look at verse 20. Peter says, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't help. And think of this. How many times... In the name of public security, because I'm sure the authorities would say, well, this crowd's getting out of hand. There might be some demonstrations that could come out of this. All these, look at 5,000 men, 10% of the population. We've got to get this thing under control. How many times, in the name of public security, have those in authority used the fear of danger to silence and suppress legitimate testimony? In fact, I find it odd today that if I want to speak in the name of Jesus only, that there's no one else, that I say that, I find it odd that some people would say that I'm guilty of hateful, violent speech. Isn't that odd? It's odd today how those like me who use my speech, I'm called violent. And yet those who use violence, they call that their speech. Food for thought. I got to tell you what I've seen and what I've heard. Now the crowd, the, the authorities, the authorities, they're afraid of these crowds. They, they're afraid they're going to riot. Look at verse 21. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. 
On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Isn't that interesting? What's the first thing they do when they get out? They go back to their own people. They, they go back to the... It's interesting, isn't it, that persecution produces unity. They go back to their own people. Hardship brings us together. It pushes us toward each other. And look at verse 24. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. Would you write this down, number five? We're unified in our praise of God. We're unified in our praise of God. And I want you to see what this prayer is. And this is where Psalm 2, they quote Psalm 2 that we had read before the sermon today. So look at their prayer. It begins in the middle of verse 24. They say, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? And that's the quote from Psalm 2. It begins with a question. Question for God. God, why are people in power using their power this way? Who are they using it against? Look at who they're using it against. Verse 26. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together. Against who? Against the Lord and against his anointed one. So Jesus is God's anointed one, not King David. King David is not the point of this, of this psalm. Jesus is the rightful king. And what's really, what really cut the people that Peter was speaking to right to the heart was when Peter quoted this, when Peter quoted Psalm 2, it was about godless pagan nations who were opposing Yahweh. And Peter applied it to the religious authorities and said, you're just like the people in Psalm 2, who you think are awful. You've become what you said you hated. Look at verse 27. The prayer continues. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, this is their prayer, they met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city, notice this, to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, they did what your power, and notice this, verse 28, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. God was in control of all of this. All of the free will actions of independent actors, God was in control of all that. They weren't God. Their free will wasn't God. They were free to make the choices they made, and they are held responsible for the choices they made, and their choices were real, but ultimately the church knows when they pray, they're praying to the sovereign Lord, who's, and Jesus is the Lord of all, heaven and earth, and they're praying to him, and nothing that these people who oppose Jesus can do is outside of Jesus' control, ultimately. You see, today we live between warring factions. And what, they want, what, what the world wants to do to us today in our country is they want to get us to be committed to one political party or the other. And we have to resist that at all, at all expenses. We cannot sign on to a political platform. We have to make our message about Jesus. And if they try to drag us into a topic, we have to figure out how we're going to talk about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Look at verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You know what's interesting about this prayer? They didn't ask God to stop the persecution. They didn't say, God, make the suffering stop. They said, God, give us boldness to speak about Jesus. So would you write this down in your outline? Would you write down, we pray for greater courage to speak. Verse 30, 
31, it says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And notice what they did. They spoke the word of God boldly. So don't fear the rage of your culture or the headlines. That rage can never overthrow what God has planned and purposed for us in Jesus Christ. Despite those threats, Jesus' work continues on earth through us as we're filled with his spirit. I'd like to invite the prayer partners to come forth at this time. If they would come to the front, I want you to see who they are. And if you need prayer for something in your life this morning, I would like you to come and see them. They're going to come to the front here. At the conclusion of the service, you come up here, and they would love to pray with you. Whatever is on your heart, whether it's about the message today or not, you come to the front after the conclusion of the service, and they would love to pray for you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you how it is by your grace alone that we can boldly speak about Jesus, that there's no other name. Jesus, thank you that you are Lord of heaven and earth right now. And I pray that you would bring back to mind the things we've heard from your word this morning, the things that you filled and you've put in Peter's heart and mind, that we'd remember that when we experience opposition from those in authority. Give us the grace that we need because it's your grace alone that can do this. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.